Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Green Hydrogen Forum and Expo. First in kind as a restart, part of the Smarter E as organizer together with the European Electrolyzer and Fuel Cell Forum EFCF. We have in cooperation with the Hydrogen Europe and the Deutsche Wasserstoffverband organized this Green Hydrogen Forum. And the history is grown out of the intersolar, originally PV-oriented drive to electrify and to reduce our carbon emissions in the direction of a closed carbon economy. And out of this, we feel home here at the place where we see the intersolar that also takes care of the smarter E for energy storage and batteries. And also our question, how we drive and charge our cars. This includes the hydrogen in a world. And this series of presentations, we are happy to present a nice speaking range. And with that, in order to start, I would like to thank all the co-organizers and supporters and hand over the word to Felicia Mester from Hydrogen Europe, Senior Policy Advisor, to moderate this first morning session. Uh, looking forward, Felicia, please, the word is yours. Good morning, everyone. It is lovely to see all of you gathered once again at the Smarter E at InterSolar. Um, and it is also great to see that uh, the Hydrogen Forum has taken um, a newer shape that is growing and that the hydrogen industry is gathering momentum. Um, with this, I would like to um, present the new, the first speaker, uh, Yorgo Chati Markakis, CEO of Hydrogen Europe. Um, Yorgo, uh, before being CEO of Hydrogen Europe, uh, was representative of Infineon Technologies in Brussels. But more than that, he was a member of the European Parliament for more than a decade, where he contributed to laying the cornerstone for the joint undertaking on hydrogen and fuel cell. Yorgo, the, word, the, the platform is yours. Thanks very much for um, giving us here the opportunity to talk about hydrogen as an enabler of the circular economy. And uh, as this is the Smarter E, I would like to show also that uh, this has really, really a lot to do with solar technology um, in our life. Um, there is a presentation with lots of pictures, so not a lot of figures, but lots of pictures here. But the presentation needs to be uploaded. Um, uh, before this is uploaded, I would like to first of all say that it's the second time that hydrogen uh, takes some space here at this wonderful exhibition. It's different and hard times after the uh, pandemic, so it's uh, a smaller setting than the years before. But I'm sure that the hydrogen part in this exhibition will grow and that the next uh, exhibition, I think in May, Smarter E, uh, will be back in the old, good old shape uh, that it was before. I would like to talk to you about the hydrogenewables because hydrogenewables is a, it's a new word. It's something that will be quite important in the next years, in the next decade to come. And the first question is, how do great economic paradigm shifts in history emerge? And there's no doubt that uh, the pandemic, I talked about it uh, with regards to this conference, but there's also a clear connection of the pandemic to the pace of the energy transition that we are living in. I can clearly see that uh, especially the Brussels environment, so people, policymakers, deciders in Brussels, had the opportunity to decide whether to go back to the traditional life when the energy demand dropped down, you remember very well, in March, April last year, or to go for something new. And this is definitely a catalyst. This has been a catalyst, and in this case, this uh, paradigm shift in history, the pandemic, was favorable to hydrogen. Now, let me show you that I believe we are in the midst of the third industrial revolution. Here you can see the first revolution, which was, well, steam power, abundant coal, locomotives and telegraphs. So that was the infrastructure, the energy, and the way to communicate. We are still 
very much affected by the second industrial revolution with centralized power, still, still cheap oil, combustion cars and the telephone. However, we live already certain elements of the third revolution, which is solar and wind, hydrogen renewables, digital mobility and the internet. And I think we need to take ourselves into account that we are witnessing this major shift, this major paradigm shift. And uh, so far, a lot of people thought also on this special exhibition here, yeah, electrification is the key. But ladies and gentlemen, still we have 20% of our energy system based on electrons, 80% on molecules. So rather than turning this to 100% electrons, and I will show that this is very, very difficult, we rather should think about just greening the molecules. And hydrogen is a very good uh, opportunity to get there. Now, this only works if we look at it on a global scale. There are people who think, yeah, we could produce hydrogen here, and well, it's not that efficient, and of course it's not efficient to produce hydrogen from photovoltaic here. But if you see at this map here that you could produce already today in Saudi Arabia for a much lower price, here you see the output in Europe. So the hydrogen costs are three to six euro per kilogram. This is, some people call it the champagne of the energy transition. And definitely, champagne needs to become Prosecco, and Prosecco needs to become table water when it comes to price. But this is already the case. If you, if you see here in Saudi Arabia, here the output of kilowatt hours per panel is much, much higher. It's twice, maybe even more that much as in Europe. And here you can see that the hydrogen costs are already down to two euro per kilogram. And look at this nice hot spot here. That's uh, the Acatama Desert in Chile. 2,000 meters high, cold, lots of wind, lots of sun, but cold. Here, the production costs are already cheaper than one euro per kilogram. So this is the reality. And whoever talks about the efficiency in my battery electric car, yeah, he should talk about this. But this has nothing to do with the overall system efficiency. And if you really want to go into a new energy paradigm, if we really want to do the paradigm shift, we need to acknowledge that hydrogen will become a global commodity with a spot market, with a spot price. We believe that this whole market making mechanism will start 25 to 35. As of 35, hydrogen will be a global commodity. And if you ask me, Rotterdam, I'm not Dutch, Rotterdam should be the spot market where the price is made up and denominated in euro. Now, let me talk about one other thing. That's raw material, critical rare earths, because this talk was about circular economy. Look at this here. This is not my figures. This is the figures one year old of the IEA, the International Energy Association uh, Agency. And they came up this week with a second hydrogen report, which is basically confirming what they said in their first report two years ago, which is it will become a global commodity. What you see here is the critical earths, lithium, graphite, cobalt, nickel, rare earths, that you need already today. So if we go for the sustainable development scenario, this is basically uh, the critical raw material that we will need. And you see that for the electricity networks and also for EVs and battery storage, that's the orange and the yellow one, in this four times accelerated uh, scenario, IEA figures, you need already plenty of it. And now look at the net zero by 25 scenario. So you can see at the top, you can see a tiny little thing which is called hydrogen. These are the rare earths, the raw materials, the critical raw materials that you need for hydrogen. It's not a lot. Why am I saying that? Because whatever we do, whatever we say, it's nice to talk about efficiency, but efficiency needs to take into account cost efficiency and critical raw material efficiency plus energy efficiency. And even if we would only account for, um, for the energy efficiency, this here shows clearly 
that a car, a battery electric car, you will find some of them here, that takes electricity from a European panel, in the end, will be similar efficient than a car, compared to a car that takes hydrogen produced in Saudi Arabia or Northern Africa, and even if you transform it into hydrogen, electricity, renewable electricity, and even if you bring it via pipeline to Europe, the efficiency, the energy efficiency, will be the same. If you would bring it from Chile, it would be even yeah, difficult because there we have no pipeline. So this is based on the pipeline connection. So this is why system efficiency counts, and that includes much more than energy efficiency. Now, when it comes to the comparison between the electrification uh, via battery and via fuel cell cars, and we always should talk about battery and fuel cell mobility, because it's, it's one. But here you see that the, the raw materials that you need here in uh, the fuel cell case is 20 times less critical raw material. And again, we will need a lot of these panels all over the globe to produce renewable energy. We will need a lot of rare earths to the, for the production. Don't waste it for mobility. I'm very crystal clear now. When Mr. Dies, the CEO of Volkswagen, tells us, yeah, you should not use hydrogen in trucks, this is, excuse my French, stupid. This is not good because you should not carry six tons of batteries for 600 kilometers on the road. Doesn't make sense. And that is why we need to say it loud and clearly, Mr. Dies because he was faking news, he was faking, he was telling that hydrogen efficiency is 11%, it's not true. Synthetic fuels, yes, 11%, absolutely agree. But don't mix it up. He's the CEO of one of the biggest companies on the globe. He, he not only should know, he's faking news. That's not fair. If we talk about energy transition, we should be open, clear, and right. Let me now show you just pictures. Tomorrow, we will uh, open an exhibition in Groningen, uh, which will be one of the hotspots in, in Europe, and it will be the king of the Netherlands who will open an exhibition with some pictures that uh, we put in order to show what? This energy transition creates jobs. It's about people working with this energy. And we want in this exhibition to show it's not an abstract chemical technology, which is boring, no. Here, this guy is uh, shortly about changing the stack. You can see here the stack, and uh, the guy who works for Gasuni in the Netherlands uh, is, is taking out stack and replacing it. We filmed it, and in uh, due term also see it on a video. But here, blue-collar jobs will be turned into green-collar jobs. And this will happen all over Europe and all over the globe, especially in the Gulf region. You will see that. here. This is drilling a salt cavern. What these guys are doing here is preparing a test. We are testing with nitrogen, whether it's easier to do it with nitrogen, whether the hydrogen can stay there. So they are testing with nitrogen, and then they are storing big amounts of hydrogen in that salt cavern in the northern Netherlands, because that is what hydrogen is also about. It's a storage capacity for renewable energy, for the intermittency, to balance the intermittency. I'm not sure whether you are familiar with the cost of this balancing that we need to do. Last year, I'm uh, also German, last year, and I'm very proud of that, 46% of German energy was renewable. Had to do with the pandemic, but also it was a clear strategy to go there. 46%, that's a lot for a highly industrial country. The cost of it, 1.5 billion curtailment, 30.5 billion, it's balancing. 32 billion of costs for renewable energy. Nobody's talking about that champagne. Everybody says hydrogen is the champagne. This is also champagne. And we could help by letting hydrogen do the job to balance out, to buffer energy systems, and to store in these caverns, among other. There are also other possibilities to do. This is a hydrogen barbecue. <laughs> And um, it has been developed by a Dutch professor. But you can see that hydrogen will enter more and more into our life. People were asking me, journalists are asking me, will I be affected 
next to the car, and you can see the, I think over there, you can see a, a fuel cell car from uh, Mirai, the Toyota Mirai. You can see the uh, Nexo from uh, Hyundai. And in one year time, so in this building, BMW exhibited uh, a few uh, weeks ago uh, the X5, uh, the BMW hydrogen car. I will, I'm now driving uh, uh, at the moment proudly a Nexo, and it works really on a high mature level. And I got the news that uh, in one year time I will also have the opportunity to drive a BMW, and I will do so proudly. It works. But this is not the only way how hydrogen enters into our life. Hydrogen will also warm your house, give you electricity. And there are new calculations, and um, yeah, I, w I was amazed uh, this morning to see a, a very interesting calculation that it's even cheaper under certain conditions to use hydrogen for the electricity in Prague rather than taking electricity directly from the grid. Fantastic. And we are on the way to go into that direction. Ladies and gentlemen, shift happens. It is on its way. You cannot stop it anymore. But we could do the mistake to delay it. And this is what we don't want to do. We now have done a lot as the hydrogen community. We have the right strategy. It came uh, July one year ago. This year in July, the regulators and the policymakers presented to us um, a regulatory strategy. So we have 12 laws presented by the European Commission, 3,000 pages, and more than 1,000 times hydrogen has been mentioned. Wow. So our job, my job as Hydrogen Europe, is now to defend what has been presented, to defend it uh, with policymakers, with uh, um, co-policymakers like European Parliament and the member states. Ladies and gentlemen, and we are going that way, money is also there, but we need to make sure that money, public money, but also private money, investors' money, can be brought to the projects which we are now starting to, we call it green engineer. We are green engineering the projects. We know that these projects need to be visible, need to be tangible, and then the rest comes. So, this shift, this big paradigm shift is a reality. And when we were here for the first time, I think two years ago at this exhibition, it was, we were some, somehow exotic birds here, huh? so the hydrogen people in, in a corner. I am sure that over the next years, the whole hall here will be full of hydrogen exhibition. And I don't exclude that there will be the day where we we'll change even the name of this exhibition. But that's another, <laughs> that's another story. Thanks very much for your attention. Uh, this will be a very, very interesting uh, conference here. I think my next speaker has another interesting topic. But uh, I give it to uh, Felicia to moderate, so to say, the, the next speaker. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jorgo. Well, I think this was a very good way to kickstart our day, our uh, presentations, uh, our conference here, but also the Green Hydrogen Forum. Um, I would like to now invite um, our next speaker, Frank Engel. Uh, former MEP, Secretary General of the Christian Democratic Political Group in Luxembourg and uh, President of the same party until 2021. He has now joined the efforts of the hydrogen industry and is working alongside companies, governments, policymakers on a master plan for hydrogen. Uh, Frank, the floor is yours. You'll leave that to me. Very good. Thank you, uh, Felicia. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. On your programs, it might look as if I had the pretension to represent the economic community of Western Africa. Um, that is not what I will claim that I'm doing, but um, I might speak to you uh, about Africa a little uh, as well, because it will play a role in what, uh, uh, in what is happening in the hydrogen uh, world in the uh, coming years and decades. Now, my first contention is that um, we need a framework for reasoning uh, in the hydrogen debate, and that is, we need to establish the needs that Europe will have. Jorgo has uh, set the stage for the development discussion just, uh, just now. Um, we will need to precisely assess the necessity of the imports. And you've seen the map um, of the world that, uh, that, that indicates the potential locations for the imports to come from. And we also have to be aware of the coming competition. China has announced uh, a couple of weeks ago that they aim at creating 100 gigawatt of electrolyzing capacity by 2030. 
and China is going to do that. Now the question is, will we too? Because we have set ourselves the goal of reaching twice 40, that would be 80 gigawatt electrolyzing capacity by the, same, by the same year, 2030, that's in less than 10 years. 40 on European soil, that may even be reachable, but 40 outside. And the outside is, of course, a not irrelevant question uh, for, what is, for what is to, uh, to come. The climate targets, the decarbonization targets of the European economy have been, uh, have been established. By 2030, the European Commission now wants, we'll see if the legislator goes along, it's not necessarily the same story, but still, the European Commission would want 50% of industrially used hydrogen in the European Union to be green hydrogen by 2030. Now, the um, relevant thing would be that we manage to get our act together in Europe, but that we also get the uh, rest uh, together. And the European act is not going to be as simple as it may sound. If China now says we do 100 gigawatt electrolyzing capacity by 2030, it will not have to contend citizens initiatives, court cases and all the rest. This will simply not exist. In Europe it will, for all sorts of purposes, and this is something that uh, one has to bear in mind. We will not be able to fulfill all our needs alone. We will need uh, to go out there and we will uh, notably, that is my contention, our contention at Hydrogen Europe as well, we will need to look uh, to Africa. We can look to Saudi Arabia as well. There's potentially in Australia, of course, there's potentially in Chile. But Africa is our brother continent, our partner continent. It's been extolled as the big partner that Europe needs for the last 10 years at numerous summits. I've attended the parliamentary dimension of all of them. Uh, for years, there have been big plans and zero realization uh, over the last decade in that sense. Hydrogen could become the element that finally binds those two continents uh, together. We'd of course need to get real about it. Commission President von der Leyen underlined the necessity of uh, the energy dimension of the EU-Africa partnership in her State of the Union speech last month in a uh, relatively clear manner. And um, it is to be believed that uh, there is an awareness of this. There's also the plan of the European Energy Union and has been uh, for a long time. <coughs> and it is obvious that that means that we should stop having every single member country of the European Union go hunting for its one or two or three strategic partners in Africa. There needs to be a European initiative for a, a partnership between Europe and Africa, where every country is going to find its place and where, of course, industries located all over the continent uh, are going to find their place. But we've also got to be uh, clear about the constraints again. We want 40 gigawatt electrolyzing capacity for imports. Now, at, this, at the present time, in Mauritania alone, this is not a country that is mentioned all too frequently in the strategic partnership discussions with, uh, with Africa regarding hydrogen, but still. It is a country of one million square kilometers and four million people. There's a lot of empty space made of desert, there's a lot of wind, and there's the Atlantic Ocean next to it. This is a territory uh, that is ideal uh, for hydrogen production. And there are projects in Mauritania alone right now, one for 32, a gigawatt electrolyzing capacity and one for 10, which has been unveiled uh, relatively recently. That alone would carry us above 40. But the decision will at some point need to be made, are we going to go for that or are we not going to go for that? Are we going to go for that there or are we going to go for the equivalent in, in, in Morocco or are we going to do something else? The cocktail needs to be, uh, needs to be clearly composed and we need to find out how exactly uh, we want to uh, make sure that by, t by 2030, in eight years' time, we will not still be sorting out which potential partners we should uh, address. It's a good thing, and that's the reason why the community of states was uh, in the program before, before me. It's a good thing that uh, the economic community of Western Africa is now taking hydrogen development seriously, uh, giving itself a strategy for it, and they will most certainly uh, in the uh, coming uh, months and uh, years come up with um, uh, initiatives of their own which are going to enable us to have partners uh, that are reliable. Africa could in this way become the first continent that does its first veritable 
industrial revolution on the basis of hydrogen. That is an, an argument that is relevant for all those who say, if you go to Africa for hydrogen imports, you're going to create uh, monolithic economies again, and that's going to be another form of colonialism for tomorrow. No, it is not. Yes, we, we will want to import some of, the, uh, some of the hydrogen produced in Africa, and there's going to be payments for it, and that's very clear. There's going to be a business case for the continent, but the continent will also have hydrogen at its disposal for its own needs. The own needs can be mobility, but also industry. In Mauritania, again, there are iron ore mines that now produce 12, 13, 14 million tons of ore a year. That is taken, put on a train, train runs 600 kilometers down the coast to the port of Nwadibu, from where the ore is shipped, totally untransformed, mainly to China. But with direct reduction of iron ore on the basis of hydrogen, you could have an iron industry in that country, the first in history. And you could do the same in quite a number of other countries, uh, thereby freeing them from the need of imports uh, of products from here or from China or from wherever. And this would be exactly what the African continent has been looking for for such a long time, an industrial capacity uh, of its own, able to fulfill the needs of a growing population and creating jobs for a growing population. The population of Africa is supposed to double uh, by mid-century, from now 1.2 billion people to two and a half or something. Uh, like that, these people will need and want jobs, and hydrogen is one of the factors by which uh, this, can be, uh, this can be reached. Now, I've said at the very beginning, beware of the competition, because China is going to be there. China is always going to be there, because China moves forward. It has as good as colonized Africa by a lot of endeavors over the last 10 years. And if it needs space for hydrogen production and for its own 100 gigawatt electrolyzing capacity, it will go and get them. And we will no longer be able to do that. So if the European continent, which is a continent of innovation and wants to be a continent of innovation, if Europe, which is at the forefront of climate developments over the next, uh, uh, over the next years, wants to retain that leading position, it cannot be so that come 2030, we will start buying hydrogen from China. This is not saying that there should not be partnerships. Of course not. China and the European Union will be two big global actors in the future, and that will stretch to every sort of domain of human activity. Hydrogen is going to be one of them. But let's not put ourselves in a position where we would need to buy hydrogen from them they will have their needs, we have ours, and we can fulfill ours in partnership with the continent next to us that we've colonized once and that we can now seriously have help uh, develop in a meaningful way in the 21st century. That requires a master plan, and that master plan requires European ambition, and it requires European ambition now. It will not be enough to discuss these matters for another five years, because if we discuss the matters for another five years, we will miss the goals set for 2030, and after that, we'll miss every single goal that we've set ourselves for decarbonizing the economy to 2040 and to 2050. We can only do it in partnership. The main partnership that uh, is going to be ideal for this continent is with Africa. And we hope Hydrogen Europe does, the African Hydrogen Partnership with whom we cooperate does, that Europe and Africa together will be able to shape the hydrogen revolution to come. Thanks for your attention. You are saying we need a hydrogen uh, master plan. What is the, 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 the master plan, Frank? We've spoken about the need for a hydrogen backbone. We've spoken about the need for imports. How, how do we, what is our master plan? How do we ensure that we actually get those volumes to Europe? I have the impression that uh, right now we are still pondering possibilities. But the possibilities will eventually have to translate into realities. Um, one of the questions is obviously, how are we going to get the stuff here? Felicia just, uh, just, just referred to it. Well, we can get it by ship, but it will be better if we use pipelines. And if we want to use pipelines, we need to build them. And if we want to drag hydrogen from Africa, then we need to invest in pipelines that bring hydrogen from Africa. And there are not 715 possibilities for it. There is, uh, there, there is an existing network that runs roughly through Tunisia. I'm not absolutely certain that Tunisia is going to be a producer country anytime soon, uh, for a lot of um, political and security-related reasons. 
Then there is a possibility uh, on the eastern side of the Mediterranean, and there is obviously the Western African possibility, where both business people and the ECOWAS region are contemplating a pipeline that would run round the West African shore to North Africa and then across the Strait of Gibraltar to Europe. That's the thing that would be most useful. That's the thing that would be most helpful because it would uh, be able to collect, so to speak, uh, production in a lot of spots that you have on the West African coast. It would allow virtually every country uh, to feed in there and it would allow a constant flow uh, up, to, uh, uh, up to the European shores. Obviously, there is one or the other geopolitical hurdle to be taken because it would have to run through the Western Sahara. Um, there's hardly a possibility to circumvent that, and, um, and that might be of concern, but uh, not the main one. The main one is it needs to be built. And if we plan it now, it's not going to be there in three years. And if we plan it in three years, it's not going to be there in six. And if we plan it in 10 years, it's not going to be there in 15. All that while well, we have to bear in mind that we want a certain amount of hydrogen available from Africa by 2030, ideally with production started. And that means that the longer we tarry with a pipeline, the longer we'll have to ship. Pipeline is a huge investment, and this is where, and this is where really the European Commission and European funding sources uh, do come in, for the very simple reason that um, there will need to be some billions on the table. Now, the billions are somehow there. They're earmarked but they're not allotted, they're not allocated in a, clear, in a clear manner because we haven't taken the decisions that need to be taken before. Who to partner with, how to do it, what to invest in. European Investment Bank is a logical uh, actor to come in there as well. And it would be my wish that within the next three to six months we manage, together with, uh, with the institutional actors of, uh, of the European Union, to hammer out a plan which is going to uh, contain clear figures. We will probably need quite a number of billions in terms of investment in production capacity. The Mauritanian projects, for instance, would all require between 10 and 40 billion euros. I'm not going to say that that's all going to come from the European budget, but there will have to be some coming from the European budget uh, for that. And a pipeline is going to cost additional billions, I'm not going to mention a figure because we don't know how long the thing is going to be and how exactly it's going to, to take shape, but this is a billion euro investment, which is not going to be shouldered by industry alone, at least not as long as we do not have a clear offtake perspective um, in the European Union for the uh, hydrogen produced on the African continent. So all this, all this needs, to, needs to flow together. We now have established that we want hydrogen, we need hydrogen, electricity is not going to be enough on its own. What a realization, but still it's now, it's now there. We have the partnership with Africa established. So these are the cornerstones. Now I have to start building the house and I wish that this house is going to be built faster than houses are built in many European countries and places, because if not, um, then we are going to be uh, where I said before. Um, it might then be easier in 2030 to just ask China how much they want per kilo. Thank you. That's a very pragmatic way to put it. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. So um, we have spoken about the third economic revolution. We have spoken about the clear needs for hydrogen. We have spoken about the raw materials, all the implications around its production. Now, um, I would like to invite Christoph Hugel to speak about how do we switch gear to hydrogen. Um, a couple of short words. Uh, He's uh, director um, at um, Energy System Deutsche Energie Agentur, German Energy Agency. Uh, he is responsible for DENA projects on the further development of energy systems with main focus on an integrated approach, spanning to all energy carriers, energy infrastructures, and energy applications across all sectors. Christoph, floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much, Felicia. Thank you very much. Yoga first for the very uh, well, 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 high energy uh, impulse. And thank you, Frank, for also putting some very important points on the agenda for today, actually, well, in the differentiation between Europe and China. So I have to start with an apology because I have three difficulties in here. First, I love talking about 
big picture, big studies that will push forward our political discussion. And you remember us talking about the Dana study on integrated energy two years ago that was pushing the German politics towards, an, um, towards a future thinking on green gases and on hydrogen. And we were developing the national hydrogen strategy out of this. So I love talking about studies like this. And it's a good time talking about something like this because we're going to publish a new Dana study that's called this time Reaching Out for Climate Neutrality, and we're going to publish it tomorrow. So I'm not allowed to talk about this today, first difficulty. Second is, the organizers asked me to talk a little bit about pushing European markets, pushing them by the help of European regulatory frameworks, by the help of the IPSA, the important projects of common European interests. And I love talking about this because we as German Energy Agency are actually very closely involved in all the processes because we are on behalf of the German Energy Ministry. We're supporting the European Commission on doing all this stuff on the IPSA projects in Europe. But I'm not allowed to talk about the details that you're all interested in. So second problem. And the third problem I'm having today is I love talking about uh, having talks with colorful slides, picture-heavy slides like you, Jorgo, had. And I was prepped with very text-heavy slides today. So bear with me, together we are for sure managed going through the very boring next 20 minutes. So this is my disclaimer for today. Uh, really, sorry about it. But what am I going to talk about then anyway? First, I am agreeing with many things that were already um, said before. Yogo said that talking about electric mobility is much more than just better electric mobility. Yes, it is. It's better electric mobility and fuel cell electric mobility. And it's important that we're understanding that hydrogen will play an important role in all the different consumption sectors as an energy carrier, but, and this is important for me, also as base for other hydrocarbon energy carriers. And, and this is also very important, hydrogen is also the base for other feedstocks that will be used in the chemical industries. So hydrogen is much more than the already very important picture that Jorgo was drawing. And talking about all this, this different aspects of hydrogen, it's very important remembering what Frank Engel was just saying, that there is a global market development going on. And we as Europe should better get going there for not reaching contact to competition out there. We are always claiming that we want to lead the competition, the global competition. We want to be the, the leader in the hydrogen technologies markets. So you'd better get going. And this is what I'd like to focus on today. So how can we switch gear to hydrogen in Europe? First, s some words on the German Energy Agency while the slides are coming. So we are a state-owned agency, a state-owned company. We grew over the past five years from about 200 people to now 400 people out of 22 different countries and nationalities. We're about half male and female. Now it's coming, thank you very much. Um, we, we grew our, our revenues from about 15 to 25 million. So this is all to tell you that we are actually very much growing because the different tasks we're working on are so much growing in complexity and in that, in that diversity. So the energy transition that started with the very simple task of please be sure that we're generating green electricity is today not just the energy transition, but a global systematic transition on all the energy systems and the overall business systems. And this is electricity, but all those different molecules as well. And this is very important. And this is why we're growing so much. We are working as a state-owned company, always working in the conjunction of politics, scientific aspects and business aspects, and we're trying to answer the big questions that are, that are to be solved for making sure that energy transition and climate neutrality are actually coming, coming true. So what are we facing in here? We're facing a European challenge, Frank was telling it, um, for not being lost in competition against China and others, and we're facing competition that we are talking about hydrogen as a new kit on the block, a new thing, and when talking about new things, we're talking about a chicken and egg problem. So we do need the energy, whether it's energy carrier or feedstock hydrogen, we do need infrastructures for this, we do need appliances on hydrogen, but those will only come if there is hydrogen, which will only come if there is infrastructure, if there is and so on. So there's a chicken egg problem. And how can we in Europe actually solve this problem in here? And this is one thing that we have to make sure that the development of this European hydrogen society is really 
core of what Europe and the European Commission is now focusing. They are, and they are giving it a lot of focus, for sure, besides other aspects of European Commission's uh, development. But hydrogen has got its focus that, it's, that it needs to be, actually. So when we're talking about hy hydrogen ramp up in Europe, there's many challenges. And I was, actually, I was giving away everything that's on this slide here with the chicken and egg problem. So we have to make sure that there is um, cost regression coming, which comes with scale, which comes with technological development and all this. And this is all in here. We have to make sure that electrolyzers are further evolving. They are there already. We have to make sure that the projects are evolving around the technology that's there. We have to make sure that infrastructure development works on, that the pipelines are there and so on. We have to make sure that we are further moving on, on innovation and technology development in there. And with all those different things, we have the problem that we're expecting everybody out there to change at the same time. So appliances, as well as infrastructures, as well as generation stuff and so on. And we have to make sure that they're changing in a way that we're avoiding sunk cost in pipelines, for example, and so on. And this is actually where, where the state needs to jump in, because this is a typical market failure. This is a typical situation where markets alone, where economic decision-making alone cannot solve the problem. So this is why I'm very happy that politics did understood this and are actually trying to provide the right, well, measures, the right instruments for providing the state aid needed in here. So we have to make sure that risk catching is actually done and is supported by political instruments as well. We have to make sure that the stranded assets are or that there are no stranded assets by actually making sure that we have long investment cycles, long planning cycles with a political stability and at the same time allowing for us the political dynamics in making sure that we're having the right pathways. So this is all what Europe is actually looking for and Europe is asking the question, how can we solve this? And one of the um, problems in here is actually that Europe is trying to make many different things together in one combined package. So we've been talking about the green package a lot, about the Fit for 55 package. Jorgo was saying uh, this, this year in June or July, they came out with 3,000 pages of new ideas and instruments. So they're doing a lot. They try, they, they, they is the European Commission, they try to make sure that we're doing many different things together, increasing production capacity, making sure that we have a strategic um, view on political and, and industrial development, making sure that Europe as a continent stays competitive compared to other continents, making sure that we have an integrated European hydrogen ecosystem, making sure that the different infrastructures are interconnected to each other. So this is all the different tasks that Europe is currently working on. And this is very important. So what can we do here? The problem that we, we all together have is, well, we understood that there's a market failure. We, we understood that there's a chicken and egg problem. We understood that businesses alone cannot solve all the problems. They are willing to invest, but they cannot invest in all the different sectors um, by, by, by business type, by economic decisions alone. So we have to make sure to, to solve this problem. And when we are thinking about, hey, how can Europe solve problems? We are typically thinking about, yeah, Europe is solving problems by providing a market. Great, check, Im very important. Europe actually helps us by providing right and stable regulatory frameworks check that's done and this is very important this is the basis for further industrial and technological development and when talking or when thinking about europe providing um, solutions we're thinking about you providing monetary support and there's the, the first time when i'm saying okay please please wait with a check when we're talking about hydrogen development typically there is no european money being put out on the table first problem in here Second is that typically the national, that the member states, and the national governments are not allowed to support companies in the problems I was describing, the typical market failure, because this would be state aid that it's in general, that's forbidden. So we have to make sure that we find a solution to allow state aid and at those different aspects where we do need uh, to solve the chicken egg problem and the market failure problems. And this is where Europe came up with, a, with an instrument that's called Important Projects of Common European Interest, IPCEI, IPSI, we, we call it in Germany. And what's very important in this is this is not a funding program. So there is not 
a, a single euro on EU money in there. But this program allows the national member states to give out national money in state aid programs. So this is very important. This is no EU, EU money, but national money, but it, it allows the member states to put out this money. And this is very important. Here in Germany, you remember last year, the German government published a national hydrogen strategy, and German government said, OK, we are willing to put out money on the hydrogen development. We are willing to. Um, to give out 7 billion euros for national development of hydrogen projects, plus another 2 billion for international projects. So there's money there, and IPSI provides a framework in which the money is going to be uh, allowed to be spent. Actually. So this is very important understanding this. IPSI really allows us um, supporting projects that can demonstrate clear spillovers. Spillovers, technological-wise, that are reaching be above your different business networks, above the different uh, member states, above different sectors. So it's very important having spillover and technological knowledge increase above different sectors. IPSA allows us to really support breakthrough technological innovation and so on. So IPSA could be a very important uh, instrument out there. And I, I know that many of the different companies that are active in the hydrogen market did actually apply for IPSA project support. Um, what, what is IPSA supporting? Well, in very in general, IPSA is supporting projects in research, development, and innovation, this RDI. This, this first block in here, IPSA is actually supporting further industrial deployment stuff, so ramping up the different uh, infrastructures, different appliances and so on. And IPSA is supporting projects in the environmental energy transport projects. This is, frankly, this is infrastructure projects. And this is, an understanding this means with IPSA, with the, the, over, the overarching framework that IPSA provides, it's possible to support all the different project types that we need to get going for the market ramp up in, in Europe. Then. What, what's going on? What's the current state? Um, beginning of last year, it was, I think, uh, 22 EU member states plus Norway agreed to together sign a manifesto, making sure that, yes, we are ramping up, or we are starting, we are launching an IPSA for hydrogen. And by now, more than 400 projects have been handed in. And now with this first hydrogen IPSA wave, um, there's a huge problem that we have to make sure that we're making the different um, groups of companies or bringing different groups of companies together because IPSA means it must be different companies from different member states, at least two member states, but preferably more than two. So this is a very important task. Now bring together different players from different member states. And this is why um, right now there's a very important process going on. We as Germany and the Federal Ministry of Economics and Energy and we as German energy agencies are supporting them in doing that. And we as Germany are currently uh, in the process of supporting the matchmaking process of all the different uh, member states and all their respective companies that are applying for IPSA support in this first wave. And the second wave is already going on right now. And we're trying to find the correct matches between the different companies that could work together. In this first wave, there's a focus on integrated projects. So it's very important that this is not just a electrolyzer project, but you have to make sure uh, also thinking about where does the energy come from, maybe where does green um, carbon come from, what are you producing and for which um, appliances are you producing this, or where is this going to go to? So you have to have an integrated approach. It's not just a technological approach and electrolyzers and so on. Right now, in Germany alone, we have about 230 projects we are checking cu currently. Uh, we have pre-selected 62 projects in the summer this year, and they were published. So probably you all have seen those projects. Very important. And currently, there's the pre-notification being sent to the EU Commission. By the end of this year, we're going to send a notification to EUCOM. And we are hoping that the first projects can actually um, be launched beginning in the first quarter of 2022, next year. And what is going on currently in Germany is said 62 projects being selected from production over infrastructure, industrial users, mobile users, and infrastructure. And this infrastructure aspect is very important as well, because those infrastructures that you can see here are already trying to make an overall European 
um, approach. So this is unfortunately only a map of Germany. But the infrastructures, the pipelines you can, you can see in here, do not stop at the German border, <laughs> but are, of course, going over to the Netherlands, to Belgium, to Norway up there, and to many different countries. Then. So this is very important that the IPSA projects do have an international cross-member state approach, of course. So what are we talking about? In those 62 projects, we're talking about roughly 1,800 kilometers of pipelines. This is much more that has been discussed in this e, uh, hydrogen start net in the beginning, 1,200 kilometers. So this is an important hydrogen network expansion that could get going, that could start in here. And what's very important, this pipeline um, expansion should start very shortly. So they're, they're aiming for most of it by the end of 26 and the rest by the end of 28 for the latest. So this is really a couple of a few years, or this is a, a, a thing of a couple of years. This is not going uh, over the next decade, so it's very important. So we're also talking about uh, infrastructure pro projects in hydrogen storage, which is very important. In Germany alone, we're talking about three different hydrogen storage and facilities and locations, and we're talking about a tremendous uh, investment opportunity in here. Why is it put down here in investment volume and financial gap? Because the IPSE allows us to, um, to, to, to financially support the investment need that cannot be covered by economic means. So this investment gap that you cannot return or re-earn um, in your project at all. So this is the, the almost one billion financial gap that those IPSA projects are going to cover here in Germany. Really tremendous effect on the market then as well. So what's the challenges on here? Well, the challenges on here is that this is a project and a process that's happening within 22 member states plus Norway, so many different countries with several hundred companies. So it's just a very complex process. And this is where I have to say, well, sorry, please stay patient. The project takes longer. It takes longer than everybody thought and that everybody was wishing for. But the process is going it's going slowly because it's a complex process. But this is really a challenge on a political level. And what, what's then very important is that there is also some very positive effects with this. With those IPSA projects, we have for the first time a central instrument that allows us to coordinate state aid on many different countries, member countries, member states. And we have a very high commitment, both on the political side in the nations, as well as on the EU level, as well as on the industry level. So IPSA really, well, IPSA really allows us to switch gears, which is needed right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you so much for this great presentation. Um, I would like to ask the audience if there are any questions that uh, you might have. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Jugel. But there's one point I strongly disagree with you. You said that there is no investment money coming into green hydrogen. I can tell you the largest building society in the United Kingdom has made an investment fund in Luxembourg of 1 billion euros exclusively for green hydrogen. Another family in Holland, and I'm from Holland, uh, is investing 100 million euros in an integrated program of solar, wind, and, and solar energy in Spain. 100 million. So there's a lot of money coming into green hydrogen. Thank you. Th thank you very much for the, for the, uh, the, the addition on this. Either I was just doing an error while talking so fast, or there was a misunderstanding, of course there is investment money going into hydrogen markets, a lot, in the billions. Yeah? But what I'm saying is that IPSI, the important projects of common European, um, common European interest, thank you, uh, is not the instrument that brings European money into those projects, but it's the instrument that allows national money being given to the projects as state aid. So there is investments going into the hydrogen markets and on the very different aspects as well. Thank you for the addition. Thank you. Well, if there are no other questions, then thank, thank you, you so much. much for this great presentation. Switching uh, gear to hydrogen,
and developing an uh, EU hydrogen society is also about ensuring that this uh, European technology takes off here in Europe, that it brings economic recovery post-COVID-19, uh, that it reduces emissions, as it should, and uh, brings jobs, many sustainable and clean jobs. Therefore, I would like to invite Werner Diewald, chairman of the board uh, of the German Hydrogen and Fuel Cell Association. He is also chairman of DWV and spokesperson of the Experts Commission Performing Energy to speak about green hydrogen from and for Europe. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. The yeah, green hydrogen from from and for Europe, we heard it before from Frank Engels and also from um, Jörg Schatzmakakis. The job opportunity of that is very, very high. Only a little bit advertising for our association. But uh, for me, the picture more important. You see, all branches are built up here. And that shows we not only speak over energy or industry, all branches are involved in this uh, now changing system of the energy or of our en energy system and defossilizing of the energy world. And I think that is a big challenge on one side. On the other side, that is a big, big opportunity to, to get a high market share, um, create you know, new jobs and create a new feeling for the European Union. I think that is not only in the focus of, or in the mind of a lot of people, but I will show you and I hope I can explain you why green hydrogen, the renewable energy world, is really a new chance to feel the European Union in a new style and see what, what the benefits or create benefits between our member states. I compared a little every time with the uh, Mutan Union, I think it's 30 years ago or 40 years ago that so that was yeah, the, the beginning of the European Union. I think we have the same chance again. You know, the German national hydrogen strategy is uh, started now. We create now a green mar uh, hydrogen market in Germany. Uh, the German government will be spent 9 billion euros in the market or to create a hydrogen market. That is a good move. But that is not only a story. I think the, the German government have understood that is not only a boom, it's not only a trend, it's really a huge opportunity for the German and European industry. And I will show you later some numbers. I hope that will be, give you the reasons why that is so. So develop a whole market for hydrogen technologies in Germany and open the way for imports of green hydrogen. So the German government expect the government, and you know that a little bit and conservative every time the government, they expect that we have to increase the hydrogen using or the demand of hydrogen in the next years with 100%. And of course, it must be green. And that is a huge market only on the German market. That's not a five gigawatt market. What is mentioned out in the hydrogen strategy is a 20 gigawatt market. And that is in line with the European initiative of the two time 40 gigawatt. So 40 gigawatt latest in 2030 in the European Union and 40 gigawatt outside the European Union. And the background of that is we need this green hydrogen to reach our climate targets in 2030. If you ask the experts, then the number is a lot higher. But I think these numbers are really a challenge. If you see what we in installed in Germany now, we have around one gigawatt. It's announced now. In the end, we have 68 power gas projects. You can say now, so it's not possible to reach a 40 gigawatt. I want to show you we have 68 power projects, which is a commercial operation. It's announced one gigawatt for this year to install. So the technology is ready. That is not research and development. The technology is there. Only the market is not there. The regulations are not there. We need now the regulations if we believe that we can reach the climate targets. So we have the IPSA projects, we heard it before. German has announced 62 projects, or selected 62 projects, and a lot of projects comes from the infrastructure, but also in the industry using, especially in the steel using. The steel manufacturers can only reach a, a high, a, the, the climate targets with green hydrogen. All other solutions are not really 
useful to reach a climate target, to reduce the emissions, and they have to decide, and that is not only guilty for Germany, it's guilty for the European Union. You know, we have the Second World War, and after that, a lot of uh, devices was destroyed, and the steel manufacturing was destroyed, it was rebuilt, and now we come in a phase that in the next eight years, we have a reinstalling over 60% of the in steel installations. So we have now decided, and they operate within 50 years, or more than 50 years, we have now decided the technology for 2050. It sounds every time, we have enough time, 20 years, it's a lot of time. But for the industry and for this type of installations and technologies, it's tomorrow. They have decided now, in the next five years. They can, and a, a chairman of a big company told me, if I make now the economic decision, I know that I'm bankrupt in 2040. If I install now the right devices, I do the right thing, but I immediately bankrupt. So I need regulations. We want to diversalize, we want to go in the future, but we need a regulation. So, and the renewable energy is, you, you know, everywhere it's windy, it's the sun is shining. If you go in the south, the sun is 4,000 hours shining, that is nice. But the question is how we can transport the energy content to the industry areas. And that is not new. Why we built pipelines? You know this big story about Nord Stream. Why we see a lot of tankers. That is not a new idea from the renewables that we have to store energy, that we have to transport the energy around the world. That was in the past also. But now the energy content or the resource of energy changed. That not more. And so now we have a new chance. And if we look on the renewables and we look on the countries which are not so strong in the economic, but they are very, very close to the European Union, we have suddenly a new chance, a new opportunity to give them more economic power. You see here now where we have the production costs around the world, and you see, of course, in the middle around the world, the costs are very, very low because you have a lot of wind, you have a lot of, of uh, sun, and you see the whole area, it's very, very big. And then you see only this oil tins or oil fesses around the world. So you have perhaps around the world 15, 20 spots where we are now, or where we, we are depending to get the energy. In the future, renewable energies can come, can come from everywhere, and so that is really diversification. It's more security, more geopolitical security, if you make now the right things. Mr. Engels mentioned it before out, North Africa, West Africa, I will come later to that. So sheep and sustainable green hydrogen production around the world is possible. It's only the question how we get it to the European Union. If you see now the demand only, that is a study which we have uh, done uh, with Fraunhofer together. So we see amount of 150 terawatt hours in 2030, or you do it, I don't know. So, and you see the government say only 100 terawatt hours, so it's 150 gigawatt, uh, terawatt hours, 50 gigawatts in 2030. That is tomorrow. If you see now how long a permission needs, building permission and so on, we have to start now immediately. And in the end, it's a minimum 600, 700 terawatt hours. I believe it's more. So that is really a huge challenge. And on the other side, I said again and again, a huge opportunity. There is suddenly somebody who say, I need investments in all other business. Everybody is happy to find some possibilities to invest money. We heard before in this question, money is enough around the world. So it's now the question where it comes. And now you see the possibilities if we open it for the, the green hydrogen for Europe. And transport of a pipeline, that is the cheapest solution that you can find. Chip transport is 10 times more expensive. It's not a new idea from the renewables. Why we build this gas pipelines? Why we build this oil pipelines in the North Sea? Because it was, it's so cheap, it's so easy. No discussion, it's a really secured, transportable solution. If you look in the North Sea, there's now the Aqua Ventures project that is the idea to install 10 gigawatt north from Helgoland. There's enough space. 
it's only depending from regulations. The German government have to open it and then we can stall in 10 gigawatt there and produce green hydrogen. It's not the champagne. We make it champagne because we reduce the possibility to produce hydrogen. That is only from the state organized and not from technologies, not from resources. It's water. It's not more than split water in hydrogen and oxygen. If you look around European Union, and perhaps you take the, 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 uh, uh, the special uh, item now, the Ukraine. They reduce the, uh, or the Russians reduce the transport uh, through the Ukraine about 50 uh, billion uh, cubic meters each year. That means we can install 50 gigawatts immediately in the Ukraine to transport the green hydrogen to us. We give them economic chance not only to transport, they can suddenly produce the energy. So the deepness of value is a lot higher. And if you look to the south, especially ECOWAS region, for example, there is uh, in planning a pipeline for natural gas. We can build it now as a pure hydrogen pipeline. You can install very easily, 40 gigawatt for export. Uh, export. So we see around the European Union and, of course, in the European Union, that is what I mean before I mentioned out before, that is a big chance for the European Union. Pipeline transport involved our South Europe, South East Europe. Ship transport, there's no including of them, but pipelines means if it comes from ECOWAS, from North, from West Africa, that goes to Portugal, to Spain, to, uh, through uh, France, to the industry areas. And so everybody can suddenly inject the hydrogen. If they have space, enough land space, they have enough sun, they have wind, everybody can suddenly deliver energy to the industry areas. That is a big difference if you look on the gas pipeline, you need a gas field and on the other end of the pipe there are some users. If you look to Nord Stream, we know this discussion, we are depending from Russians. If you look to hydrogen and hydrogen, hydrogen, suddenly each country who is on this pipeline and have enough space and enough wind and enough sun or one of this, uh, both things, they can feed in this pipe and can transport and sell the energy to the industry areas. So that is more energy security, more diversification in supply. And so I think that is really a big uh, chance for the European Union to transfer the money in the areas which have enough sun in the European Union, which have enough wind, if I look to Bulgaria, to Greece, to South uh, Italy, to South Spain. The economic power is there really low. A lot of people are jobless. And I think there's suddenly a new chance not to give only money. I think that make not really a, a country strong. But suddenly we come in the business. And that is a chance now for the European uh, Union, but also for the German government to organize it really to, to open the regulations for that, that we start really not only energy transition, we start a new economic. So it's the same picture a little bit where you see the pipes which are existing and the most pipes are ready to use with hydrogen. It's only the compressors which have some problems, so we have to invest, of course, some money. But the pipes can be used for transport of hydrogen, and we have to see that we need a transition time. So I think before we transport really pure hydrogen, we have feed the hydrogen and the gas pipe. I know there are some experts, and they are right. It is really then the pureness of hydrogen is gone and so on. But we have to see we are in an existing economic system and that opens this blending of hydrogen in the pipes, give us a starting point to produce enough hydrogen, to, to transport it to some people who, or companies who want it and need it, and then we increase the number of hydrogen production, then we can on one point switch one pipe in a pure pipe, uh, hydrogen pipe, but in the moment, there is not really demand of pure hydrogen enough for, to operate a, a hydrogen a pipeline, a pure hydrogen pipeline. So the question is how we come in the start, how we can start it. The regulations need time, you know, on the European level it needs more time in German or in one member state it's a little bit faster, but two years, three years, four years are 
not really in a lot of time to to integrate or to develop regulations, to integrate it, to implement it in national laws. That is really fast if you can arrange it in four years, but we have no time. 2030 is tomorrow. So that is the reason why we develop in, uh, or, or in cooperation with our uh, Ministry of Economic, this H2 Global subsidy program. It's market oriented. It's an uh, auction program, which uh, really, on one side, gives you a guarantee to deliver 10 years green hydrogen for a fixed price. Um, so you have a business case and can invest in, in the devices. And on the other side, there's an auction to sell the hydrogen in the German market. Uh, so you get it for one year to a fixed price when you win the auction. And that helps really that is so the spread is financed from this program. So it's a C CFD program, but it's in line with the German regulations, competition regulations, and so on. And uh, now the German government gives 900 million for that, so that we can really build the first 500, 400 megawatts outside of the European Union and really come or start really the new green hydrogen economic and the import of green hydrogen to Germany. See it here, it's, it's, we try to create it, to increase the program to one gigawatt, in the moment it's 400 megawatt, uh, but I think that is really a good, um, good example how we can create really a very, very soon starting of green hydrogen production. We need to organize this program only one year. We started uh, one year before, and now it's implemented, and the auctions will be coming in the next months. A lot of member states co uh, look on this program, want to copy it. We discuss it to copy it on the European level to, to get more money, 15, between 15 and uh, 20 billion euros. I think that is really a very, very nice situation to create really a hydrogen economic in Germany, in European Union. And we are in competition with China, with Japan, with Korea. We have to start now. Then if you look now on the last numbers, which I will show, I think I have not so much time. If you look now, the German government, and I think a lot of people say, green hydrogen is the oil from tomorrow. I agree. And all new studies give the evidence that is, that is true. But then we discuss an annual turnover of 2,000 billion US dollars. That is 12% of the market global trading. And we discuss it with the oil pin, five gigawatt in Germany in 2030. And on the other side, we discuss oil tankers or pipelines. I think we have to look at it. In the future, we trading the, the energy, the, the main energy um, carrier, not in US dollars, we should it do in Europe, in Euro. But then we have to start now. We have now we act really ambitious. That is a big chance, our economic chance for the European Union. We have uh, done a market study with uh, Hydrogen Europe uh, together. We expect 5.4 million new jobs only in the European Union, 820 uh, billion euro annual revenue. I think need Europe more reasons to create a green hydrogen economy uh, immediately. I think we have to act now, we have to start now. We haven't to wait, let us start a green hydrogen market economy together now. The chance is really high to get a new yeah, storyline for, for, for really a big, big uh, new economic story. Um, thank you very much and uh, free for questions. You talked quite a bit about, you know, oil and gas and, and, and how it used to, how it works today. And uh, Jorgo touched upon the idea of, you know, developing a hub in, uh, in the Netherlands. Considering today's very developed hub and infrastructure um, for oil and gas in, in the German market. Where do you see the next hydrogen hub developing? Complicated question because I think the world will be complicated more and more. The hope is that it's tomorrow more. It's easy. We see it in the in the computer in the digital world. Everybody told us if you get a computer, the world will be easier. We see it's more complicated. So I don't see one hub, of course, uh, we will see it in the Netherlands, especially for the North Sea. If we create really a North Sea hydrogen production, offshore wind hydrogen production, of course, I think the Netherlands are in the focus 
and perhaps Wilhelmshaven in Germany also, but I believe really on this pipeline solution. I think the pipelines are really our big, big opportunity. Uh, not only from the economic side. I explain it's more cheaper, 10 times more cheaper than chip transports. Uh, on one side, it's more easier to transport it over the pipes. I think the pipelines of tomorrow are more storage systems also. So a pipeline can store energy. That's very important in a renewable energy world. It's, a lot of people forget it every time. If I look for the battery vehicle uh, business, uh, I, I have every time the question what they make if you have only renewable energies in the system. It's very, very difficult to store your car or to charge your car if the wind and sun is not blowing. But if you have to go to, to, to your job, you have to drive. So I think the gas pipes have a lot of uh, opportunities. It's very easy to transport, it's cheaper, they can store. Mm -hmm. And I think we need a geopolitical view on it. If I look to Ukraine, it's a challenge from the geopolitical side, to North Africa, West Africa, and so on. And also for the south of Europe and southeast of Europe. And the pipes can solve that. We can make it, uh, give them uh, economic strongness. Thank you. Thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you very much. Well, we're getting, uh, unfortunately, uh, maybe fortunately for you, but rather unfortunately, because it's such an interesting session. But we're getting um, at the very end of it. This has been an incredibly rich uh, um, series of presentations. Uh, we started off with the third economic revolution, which is happening, and hydrogen is definitely propelling it. If you aren't yet convinced, you should put your money on hydrogen. Uh, then do come speak to us, and uh, we're going to, uh, well, give you a bit more of this. Um, it is very clear, I think, we need a hydrogen backbone. We need hydrogen imports. We need more of those PCI projects that uh, Christoph spoke about. And uh, we need to ensure um, adequate volumes of hydrogen and that they are available for our industries. And to achieve this, national and regional policymakers need to come up with clear actions. And we have already done their homework um, and developed the Green Hydrogen Manifesto. Therefore, I would like to invite um, Olivier Bukeli uh, to tell you a bit more about um, this Green Hydrogen Manifesto. And in addition, I would like to also invite um, Jorgo back to the stage and uh, I would also like to have Marcus Elzeser. Thank you. Felicia, thank you for the introduction of the Green Hydrogen Manifesto. So we are here in the frame of the Smart RE with InterSolar as a tradition, with energy storage technologies all about. And we want to pave the way for a hydrogen-enabled circular economy and the decarbonization overall. Uh, that's important to us, and we have uh, gathered 12 points to make clear what Europe requires to benefit from its current stage of advance. We have many opportunities. We want to translate that John in a new industrial zurück. reality that will also provide the jobs for our children and great children. And industrially, it's about now that we need to act, and we try to formulate that as industries, as companies, so the four initiators that are the Smart RE, Deutsche Wasserstoffverband, Hydrogen Europe, and the European Electrolyzer and Fuel Cell Forum, supported by this morning by more than 50 companies. 54 companies have signed up by yesterday evening, and we see every minute additional companies signing up. We are excited about that, and we would like to keep the balance for Friday afternoon on that part. But we present to you the points that we have included in this Green Hydrogen Manifesto. And from there on, we uh, have also Q&A for the representative of the organizers in this manifesto. I would need the, the, yes, thank you. The Green Manifesto, first of all, we need to set that direction. What is really crucial and a changing point in paradigm is the CO2 content of energy carriers and vectors is to serve as the new currency of the energy system. It's very important to have this fundamental change. So from there, we have 
importance that we have science-based definitions of the hydrogen production method are required. The methodology should include all life cycle greenhouse gas emissions of renewable and low carbon hydrogen. It's critical to be open there and to be neutral. It's fact-based, science-based to compare it fully. Second, we need to have transparent and robust sustainability criteria in line with principles of the circular economy. They need to be adapted for relevant EU policy and funding programs. What does it mean? CO2 is very important, or greenhouse gases are very important, but it's not limited to that. Drawing of water, minerals, other critical elements, pollution, they need also be taken into account, and we need to include that in anything that is driven by public money, because it comes back to us for our needs. Third point, a credible certification is needed for hydrogen as a global commodity, and the certification should be traceable trackable, tradable, transparent, and trustworthy. Why do we need that? We had a CO2 trading scheme in place that 15, 10 years ago had shown many abuses and aberrations. We cannot do it and repeat that now. We need to be clear, transparent for the hydrogen economy to make it a global drive. Having a reference point in Amsterdam or Rotterdam for defining the hydrogen, green hydrogen price is ambitious and I think it's worthwhile for Europe to set this point and this flag up to have hydrogen denoted, denominated in euros per kilogram and not in any other currency. Point number four, a carbon border adjustment mechanism is needed needs to be created at a level playing field to prevent carbon leakage and protect the EU industry's competitiveness in all sectors. We are aware that initially hydrogen adaptation will increase production cost and if you want to compete on a global scale this needs to be prevented that there is unfair competition just due to this increased cost. So we need to have an entry mechanism that every time substances, iron, specifically steel, is imported into the European Union, we adjust and compensate for this difference to preserve the competitiveness of our industry. So that's for much setting the direction. Guiding the journey. To implement the hydrogen economy requires, for a limited period of time, we need to be fast. So five, point number five, we need exceptions from EU rules, e.g. relaxation or reform of state aid rules to simplify the IPSI processes that we just have seen that are so crucial. Point number six, economic incentives aiming to compensate the higher cost for renewable hydrogen production, end users higher cost due to the change to renewable hydrogen and for transforming industrial processes to hydrogen. Also very much required that we drive industry towards that new state. Point number seven, we also require and need the appointment of a dedicated EU hydrogen special envoy in charge of trying forward the EU hydrogen strategy and partnership with third countries. The third countries communication is very critical for us. We need to have a face that can discuss with those countries that are so close by. It's important the relationship. It's a diplomatic as much as an economic question on the technical question. Let's create these interfaces. From there, we need to stimulate ramp up and cost reduction. To ramp up production volumes and reduce costs, it's, it is necessary to stimulate demand on hydrogen production until a mature market has developed. So we have the aim to have this for a limited period of time to be then self-sustaining on an industrial scale because it's just the way to do. To get there, in order to get there, we require the setting of market price for different production methods of hydrogen up to a certain market share and auctions. Why do we need that? We need to have and provide visibility to the investors that they know on what cost this future commodity can be traded for a certain given period of time. This enables the investments we require today. Point number nine, we require the conversion of large part of the Europe's natural gas infrastructure to hydrogen infrastructure. 
A distinct legal framework at EU level for the regulation of hydrogen networks will allow a clean hydrogen market to emerge and prevent monopolistic behavior. It's important to open that infrastructure, to transform it. The given asset that we already have, but that could uh, become obsolete, let's take this as an opportunity. And this requires a legal framework that the actors know what they have to be expected and also allows newcomers to enter into that game, benefiting from an infrastructure and to pay for it. Point number 10, the development of hydrogen valleys with regional and local hydrogen production, storage and consumption by regulative sim simulation of renewable hydrogen demand, including quotas, greenhouse gas reduction obligations. So, whole hydrogen transition is going to happen in the regions, physically bound to locations. And there we need to have stimulation means that allow those regions to benefit from close infrastructure bound together. Now, my last two points. <laughs> we still require further points. We need hydrogen backbones, the connection of areas of low cost clean hydrogen production with large scale storage and demand centers is to be launched immediately. So that we have a pan-European hydrogen backbone system ready by the year 2035. So 2035 for infrastructure investment is tomorrow. We need to act now. But we also need, finally, our ask number 12, is the deployment of an alternative fuel infrastructure for the use of renewable hydrogen in land transport, maritime, and aviation to maximize the decarbonization potential of hydrogen across all sectors. This is meant to have access and to have pilots benefiting from this infrastructure at the beginning to develop all these technologies. Not everything will be hydrogen. We will, and we are working together with alternate technologies. We love the batteries. Every hydrogen car has a battery inside, but this is also the other way around. We need to have access to this infrastructure for the deployment to get to scale. And uh, in this regard, the neutrality, the objectivity, what energy carrier is a suitable, most suitable for every sector, this needs to be proven in the terrain, on the ground. And we need to start that. And this is what we require from the government, from the policy makers to enable that together through this Green Hydrogen Manifesto. With this, I would like to invite your companies, your actors, your associations to join the Green Hydrogen Manifesto, to sign up for it on the website. Let's make a big, let's provide this clear message to the policymakers. Let's have Europe benefiting from this opportunity that is unique. Let's take the lessons from other industries. We want to keep this industry in Europe as a core element. Thank you very much for, this for your attention. We can open to the Q&A right now. Uh, first of all, thanks very much, uh, uh, not only uh, to Monsieur Bucheli, which is the right pronunciation of this wonderful Swiss name, but also to Mr. Elsesser, to having had this idea uh, to sign up for a manifesto. <clears throat> I think uh, the first 50, and in the meanwhile, it's <clears throat> nearly 100, it's over 80, <coughs> sorry, over 80 signatories for this manifesto shows uh, that there is a big support and the, the support will even be much bigger uh, in the next uh, days to come. Also, I reiterate what I ended with in, in my presentation. This exhibition here will be a yearly, an annual, uh, so to say, lachmus test of where we are. Uh, and I remember last time I was here, I was the only hydrogen uh, um, representative on, on the stage, so to say, the audience, the, the people representing hydrogen are getting more and more. And what is important for us is it's unstoppable. That's the, the point that we can see here. It's something that was kicked off. And you, Mr. Elsesser, you helped, you helped a lot to kick this off, to support this. Also, it was difficult three years ago to see the combination of the renewables and hydrogen. Only the, the very... Um, Supportive people did that. Today, it's common knowledge, but it was also a wise decision from your side to say, let's go into that direction. Hydrogen renewables will be something that everybody will talk about in a few years. So, and we can see that this happens. You will see that uh, it's, it's also small and big companies. It's a new sector. So it's not something that existed 
it's not something that you can just repurpose. Uh, I can see this also as, um, yeah, riding hydrogen, guiding hydrogen Europe. Um, it's growing, and it's many, many different companies from different origins, different sizes, different countries. And shaping this new sector makes it difficult, but makes it also a big challenge. It's a disruptive change of courses that we see here. And this manifesto underpins, I think, underpins the right direction. And who should do the journey? I'm interested in who will be the special envoy uh, on the EU. So we're very, we're very interested to see. Let's, let's see. However, it's a good kickoff. And um, we need to have next year even more supporters. But I'm sure this will go without saying. Thank you. Thank you. I would like to also invite uh, Mr. Werner to maybe uh, comment on that. Would you like to? I think Joe had said everything uh, to that uh, and explained it for in my presentation. I think that this is the right side, uh, sign. We, we need it now. Um, for me, it's, it's a very, very good sign that we see the different uh, industries who assign this uh, a manifesto. It's, it's not only the industry, it's also energy companies, it's, but also the financing industry or the financing branch. And I think that, that seems uh, or that shows that there's really, or what we can ex see in the next few months, I hope so, and not next years. I said it before, and I think that is the reason why the manifesto must become now. We have no time to lose. Uh, the Chinese are not really sleeping. And uh, yeah, the, the, the volume uh, and the market potential is so, so high that it really uh, makes sense for us uh, to be the first ones who established the industry there, who established the first projects, and on the other side, secured our energy supply from tomorrow. Uh, I think it's also important. We see uh, other countries who uh, traveling around the world and try to, to collect uh, the countries or the delivery countries of tomorrow, of resources, what we've seen in the first presentation from Yorgo for batteries, but also for, for fuel cells and electrolyzers. And that is the technology from tomorrow. And I think we have to wake up a little bit. And I hope that this manifesto helps that we wake a little bit up or that we can wake somebody up with it especially the politicals uh, wake up um, that we have to go forward more ambitious. Uh, I will not say that there's nothing happened. We see that there's a lot of interest in the, on the political side, but in my view, they have not understood uh, about what they talk. So our, our Ministry for Economic, Peter Altmaier, said what I mentioned out before, that the oil from tomorrow, it sounds good, but I, I, I believe that he not really recognized what he said, what it means, what he said. And so I think that is the manifesto helps. I hope that it will be help that we see the, the um, dimension what we expect in the next, not 20 years. I believe that is very important for the German coalition. In the next four years, we have to decide what we want, if we want to be a part or of the hydrogen business of the world from tomorrow. I just wanted to comment because uh, Werner now dares to say, hey, Mr. Altmaier did not understand because he possibly read the news that uh, the, the German liberals now gave the green light for the so-called traffic uh, ample coalition. So there will be no CDU and no Mr. Altmaier in the future government. Huh? That's why you <laughs> dare to say this. But we have to be fair in all respect. Um, also to Mr. Altmaier, he's from my own region, he's Saarländer, so I have to defend a little bit also what he did. Yes, indeed, uh, he might not understand the whole, but that's not for the minister. He kicked off the Ipsai process. You heard about the Ipsai process and German government, the German government under the German presidency did kick off this uh, procedure. I had the honor to speak there and Mr. Altmaier was uh, the guy who backed this. But, Werner, I fully agree with you that the next four years will be decisive years. Uh, and um, I'm very, very confident that uh, this government, the traffic government, which obviously uh, is formed right now, will go into that direction. Why? Because uh, two, uh, the smaller parties uh, are driving the process and they come from different angles with regards to hydrogen. 
but it's, um, it's uh, angles that will form a bridge that will keep Germany uh, as one of the most important markets and producer of hydrogen uh, in the loop. Let's not go the way of Austria. Uh, so in Austria we have seen, uh, and that's why we were quite busy, open, we openly declare that we have been quite busy in Germany that we don't have the Austrian problem. In Austria, after the previous government that was super hydrogen focused, um, yeah, was falling apart, the new green minister was not following that path. So Austria fell a little bit back. Uh, they will catch up, I'm sure. But uh, this is important to have guide. That's why it's important to have guidelines. And this manifesto is like a guideline helping in 12 points very shortly all the governments to say, aha, this is what we need to do. And uh, now let's work for the new government to respect or yeah. to at least read and to implement this in the coalition treaty. But we will work hard on that, Werner. I think so. Yeah. Thank you so we much. We do it together. Thank you so <laughs> much. We're running out of time. Um, thank you so much, Marcus, for supporting us and for uh, you know helping us uh, kickstart this uh, hydrogen revolution here at this exhibition as well. Uh, thank you to to everyone for being here with us, and thank you for for our panelists. Wishing you a good day. Cool.